As a software engineer, I used to believe if you built a better mousetrap, the customers would come. This just isn't true. One great example of this from my own personal background is working on peer-to-peer -peer or P2P technologies at Microsoft. Hi, my name is John Miller, the Deliberate Engineer. I've been working in industry for 30 years at companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and so on. Now, over the years, I've had a lot of different experiences, and some of them make entertaining stories, also with some valuable lessons included. Today, I'm going to talk to you about my experience working on Avalanche at Microsoft Research and trying to make that into a product. In the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, peer-to-peer technologies really took off. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, peer-to-peer -peer means that rather than having a server that's doing all the work, storing all the content and distributing files and so on, it's actually the, the lion's share of the work is done instead by consumer or business computers. In other words, PCs that people have that are contributing to the peer-to-peer the -peer network. Now, the project I was working on at Microsoft Research was something called Avalanche. This was developed by uh, Pablo Rodriguez in Microsoft Research Cambridge. The idea was to take a file swarming cloud such as BitTorrent and instead of just having it ship around unmodified blocks of a file with hundreds of people sharing them, working to get the whole file, instead you uh, use something called network coding to make the transfer more efficient. Now in poorly seeded content clouds, in other words clouds where there's not a whole lot of people who have the whole file sticking around to donate it to other people, it actually can speed up transfer by about 50%. So based on the research and the results that we saw, we really thought we had something special here, a way of improving performance for a scenario that people were already using. Now, it felt like the technology was the right thing at the right time, but uh, the bigger lesson that we'll learn from this as we go along is that just because you produce a great technology, it doesn't mean it's going to meet the needs of businesses, which in turn means businesses won't be interested in using them. So it's not necessarily about creating that better mousetrap. Instead, it's creating things that will benefit businesses and they'll be able to use. After the Avalanche research was completed and published, we decided this was a good candidate for us to be able to turn into a product. So the team I was in at Microsoft Research took the results and worked in partnership with Pablo Rodriguez and Christos Gansidis. And we took a look at the pieces that were missing to be able to make a product out of it. We spent a year or two putting everything together, getting into work, making sure that it did what it needed to. I'd been working in products at Microsoft for a while, so I knew what it took to turn something from a research prototype into product quality code, and that's what we did. We thought we had a pretty good business case for this as well. At the time, if you wanted to distribute a gigabyte of content to a single person over the internet, typically the company owning the server would be paying something like a dollar, you know, a dollar per gigabyte being transferred. If you take something like Visual Studio or some of the other large Microsoft software, you can wind up transmitting thousands or millions of gigabytes of data with the commensurate costs there. So using this peer-to-peer -peer technology, it was something that we believed could lower the cost to Microsoft of distributing that data while also enabling more people to download the content at the same time. Unlike server-based downloads where the more people trying to get the data, the slower it flows to everybody, with this peer-to-peer -peer cloud, it would just keep getting better and better. And that was our goal. After the product was mostly done, we started finalizing our arrangements, both to use it for distributing products within Microsoft, the, the software packages, and also talking to other potential customers, such as movie studios, who were just getting into the game of being able to distribute their uh, movies digitally, as well as through the traditional film medium. Now about the movie studios, they were still pretty early on in the days of offering the digital content and one of the biggest focuses for them was not about saving money. Instead, it was about accumulating customers, getting more and more customers, reaching critical mass for their business and also having telemetry and information about the, the use of their product so that they could adjust it accordingly. Now for both of these, peer-to-peer -peer actually isn't a very good fit. The decentralization of transfer of data makes it harder for the uh, person who's running the content cloud to tell exactly what's going on. And uh, that all in turn means that you don't necessarily have as much control over the experience. For example, it gets harder to guarantee somebody's going to be able to download a movie they're paying for in a particular amount of time, unless they're getting it directly from your servers. So because of these two problems, 
the movie studios wound up not being very interested in the, the Avalanche technology, which was a surprise to us. Yet that was okay, that still left us with Microsoft, and we thought we could do a lot of good for Microsoft in terms of speeding up their distribution of content and making sure that there was a great experience for folks. What we hadn't counted on was the importance of taxation when you start thinking about how you're going to distribute content that somebody has paid for. In the physical product world, even for physical boxes of software, this is a pretty settled problem. There's hundreds of years of precedent, and Microsoft already has some tax advantage locations that they were uh, distributing their manufacturing and distributing their content from. For example, there was a, a block in Puerto Rico that had a specific tax advantage. There was Ireland and a few other places. So they already felt pretty safe distributing physical products. However, the story for digital products was very different. I'd sort of figured that since the internet had been around as a consumer thing from the early to mid 90s, now that we were in 2008 or so, all the tax laws would have been figured out and that just couldn't be further from the truth. The reality was nobody had really tested the, the tax laws, even for server-based distribution. They treated it as fairly safe to have servers hosted in the same place that you already had a tax advantage for physical distribution. And so you could apply that argument easily. I don't know that it had ever been tested in court, but at least you could say, well, look, we have a tax advantage for this location. We have a hundred servers there. Whenever anybody buys our software physically, we ship it from there. Whenever anybody buys our software digitally, we ship it from there. So same tax advantage, a very reasonable case. When you're talking about peer-to-peer, -peer, it gets much muddier because peer-to-peer -peer isn't just doing things from a single server. Instead, what you'd say is, well, okay, so how should we charge for this? Uh, the, the person who's buying the software is actually downloading it and helping to distribute it from home. So do they have to pay tax on that location? Or uh, they're working with a, a bunch of other peers in 50 different states, in Puerto Rico, in Germany, in all kinds of places. You know, do we owe each of those places a fraction of tax according to how much they download it? Or maybe it's based on where the server's hosted that sold the software. Or maybe it's based on the manufacturer's location where they created and signed the bits. Or maybe it's based on the retailer you know, that you bought it from. That's not the company that made the software, but they sold it. Maybe it's their corporate headquarters. Maybe it's where the server's located that handled the purchase. Maybe it's where their content distribution network was based. As you can see, there's a lot of open questions here. And none of this had really been tested in court, which means there was a very high risk if you decided to be the first one to go ahead and distribute things this way and take your best stab at paying taxes. Needless to say, Microsoft, a multi-billion dollar company, wouldn't necessarily be too excited about being one to push forward and try and get tax advantages for this new way of shipping things around, uh, among other things. They probably would maybe be scrutinized a little more heavily than lots of other people who are trying to distribute uh, digital things. So they took the conservative course, which is to say, Look, you, you might be able to use this peer-to-peer -peer stuff to distribute things that are free. There's no tax impact to that. But anything that requires a purchase, no, no. We're going to stick with server-based distribution for that. And as far as I know, that's still the way that it works today. So what happened afterwards to peer-to-peer -peer is a legitimate way to distribute content for profit or just to help a business? Well, the, the answer is that it pretty much died out. There's still a few enthusiastic companies who use it to enable free downloads and free distribution of information, but I don't know of anybody who's selling data that they're sending over that uh, over that peer-to-peer -peer medium. So it's pretty much gone away, which is uh, kind of a shame, but uh, it makes perfect sense commercially. I still love peer-to-peer. -peer. I love working on it. I love designing protocols in it, but uh, it's not something that I would recommend that anybody use for their scenarios. My general advice to anybody who's thinking about peer-to-peer versus uh, a server-based solution is use server-based unless you absolutely can't. In that case, you use peer-to-peer uh, -peer because the server-based is always going to be more reliable, more dependable, more easily tweaked, and, and so on. It's just the way it is. Well, that's it for today. If you found this story entertaining or informative, uh, if you'd like to hear more things like it, then please you know, go ahead and leave a like or leave a comment telling me what you think and think about subscribing to the channel. And as always, keep on pushing forward.